Hello. Today, I'm going to tell you a story about my favorite ecosystem, coral reefs. And I'm going to tell you that story about their past, their present, and their future as it relates to where we are right now, Hong Kong within China's great, greater Bay Area. And today, I'm going to start by framing the problem that we're all here talking about today, which is climate change. And one could argue that climate change is a result of our expanding human population. Consider that this circle represents the entirety of humanity by 2050. About 10 billion of us are going to occupy the planet. And more than 50% of us are going to live near the coastline at that time. 10 billion people fighting for food, clean water, clean air. All of these natural resources that we rely upon are going to become limited. It wasn't always that way. About 3,000 years ago, there were much fewer of us, only a few tens of millions, as represented by that red sliver of that human pie of 2050, a very small percentage. Back then, you could imagine an ecosystem and the land that was lush and verdant, forests that were filled with wildlife, natural resources that humans could take advantage of to earn a living in a, a hostile world. Those terrestrial environments, those forests, are in very important filters for what ends up in our waterways. They secure nutrients. They solidify sediments. They keep our local waterways clean and healthy. Uh, that waterway then transits down to the coastline, where we have other types of ecosystems to provide functions. Mangrove forests retain sediments. They remove nutrients. Oyster reefs do likewise, L meaning that our coastal oceans are free of nutrients and free of sediments. This is the perfect condition for coral reefs to thrive. Coral reefs are one of the most important ecosystems on our planet, and they're remarkable ecosystem engineers. Kind of like Hong Kong, corals themselves can build remarkable cities under the sea. Take, for instance, this reef in Micronesia. You can see the really complex structure. That's what scientists call rugosity. Rugosity is the complexity of the reef. And just like an apartment complex, the more complex, the more rugose a reef is, the more units there are for other species to occupy. So we can really think of these as underwater cities. And they're extremely valuable to mankind, about $30 billion per year in annual economic revenue. Rugosity is really key. It is the structure that protects our coastlines from storm damage, from erosion of our beaches, and it provides that critical habitat for a number of other marine life that we rely on for something to eat, the commercial products that we enjoy, like fish and shellfish. If we go back in time, we would imagine that the ocean looked a lot like this. This is a bumphead parrotfish on a coral reef, a large animal, bigger than me. This would have been the norm 3,000 years ago. Lots of megafauna, so many that you would have probably not even noticed the corals that are underneath them, that are building that habitat for these species to occupy. Unfortunately, things changed, and they changed rather dramatically. About 3,000 years ago in this part of the world, the landscape began to change. The forests were cleared. Agriculture replaced them, especially the cultivation of rice in Guangdong province. Agriculture has a very big impact on what happens downstream, the aquatic ecosystems receiving those effluents. Here you can see an image of Hong Kong from the 1950s, which shows that characteristic terracing of the new territories, a common feature of Hong Kong's agricultural past. Likewise, in this photograph from the Maritime Museum, which is meant to showcase the devastation of a typhoon, you'll notice in the background there aren't any trees on those slopes. And remarkably, we still have some hillsides today that are, have no trees whatsoever. And this is because, for centuries, the only fuel available to local people was wood, firewood, that was collected from the slopes. In fact, Hong Kong had been deforested many times over our history. In particular, firewood was a necessary fuel to drive two of our first most important industries, the production of salt from boiling seawater collected at the coastline, and also the production of slaked lime, which was used for preserving foods and 
and building the first buildings within our city. The demand for firewood uh, meant that when you sailed into Hong Kong perhaps 100 years ago, you might not have seen all of the bright lights that we have today, but rather you would have seen fires burning all around the perimeter of our islands. Those fires were evidence of those industrial activities. In the late 1800s, there was such an individual from the United States, William Stimson, who sailed into Hong Kong as part of the first US exploring expedition. Stimson was a naturalist, so like me, he was interested in, in looking at, at wildlife and documenting their abundance and diversity. The collections that Stimson made in Hong Kong would eventually become the foundation for what is now the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Stimson would have sailed into Hong Kong that was very different from what we have today. And in his journal, you can see here, he has documented the observation of coral reefs within Victoria Harbor in a place on a map that he designated Coral Bay, which you can see there. Coral Bay. And he noted how the corals here were healthy, they were large, they were abundant. This was rem a remarkable observation. This corresponds to Chai Wan, which interestingly translates to Firewood Bay, as I'm told in Cantonese. So Stimson would never have realized what would have happened in the 1980s when 4.5 billion people were living on Earth that the place that he collected this wildlife from Hong Kong would have been irreversibly transformed. Chai Wan today looks like this. And if you're brave enough to go diving in the typhoon shelter there, I can guarantee you, you might not find any corals. Now, Chai Wan is a, is a consequence of our economic growth and Hong Kong's incredible transformation. But what did we lose in that process? A lot of my work is focused on this area, the Greater Bay Area, which is a, a merger of so many cities that we now call it a megalopolis, home to more than 100 million people. There are few places on Earth with this level of human impact. And you'll notice from this map that in the western side of Hong Kong, many of our marine ecosystems have totally collapsed as a consequence of that development. Now, it wasn't always so bad. In fact, even in the 1980s and 1990s, thanks to these photographers that were working at the time, we have some beautiful images of what the ecosystems used to look like around here, this being a coral community in the Hoi Ha Wan Marine Park. But nowadays, you might go diving and you might see something like this. And this is the same types of corals that were present back then, but they've been hollowed out. They've been bioeroded. The process of climate change and nutrient pollution and sedimentation, all of the stressors that humans are causing, has led to this natural phenomenon being accelerated. Bioerosion is the deconstruction of a coral reef. And if the reef's growth does not outpace bioerosion, then we end up losing these important habitats. And indeed, that's what we're seeing sometimes, especially after a storm, the corals might be toppled over. And here in this image, you see a number of sea urchins, which are opportunistically grazing on the algae growing on the underside of the coral. And eventually, they will destroy that coral structure so that there's nothing left but sand. The urchins are abundant because we've removed all of their predators. We've eaten them, large fish in particular. And then I think one of the biggest stressors that came in the late 80s and early 90s was the dredging of Mears Bay. This image shows those dredgers working in Mears Bay, sucking up the sand and sediment that would be used for reclaiming Victoria Harbor. Up to 60 square kilometers have been reclaimed to date and forming what we now are quite familiar with is the major uh, urban centers of our city. But reclamation could be flipped on its side, and we might think of it as theft from the ocean. What have we lost in the process of reclamation? Interestingly, a lot of what we can know about this environmental change is right below our feet. In the sediments, especially in the sea, there is a diversity of data that is there to be collected. When a coral grows and a fragment falls off, when a fish dies and its teeth fall out of its skull, all of these hard parts, they get accumulated in sediment layers. And we can unlock the secrets of those sediment layers using a toolkit we call historical ecology. Here's my student, John Cebulski, who is 
showing you how this is done. He's got a hollow metal tube that he hammers into the seafloor, and he extracts that tube, opens it up, and then he can look at the sediment layers, which is really a time machine for what's happened in our marine environment in the past. Simply put, this is my, you, what you might see when we pull those pipes out. So this is the deepest layer where we see lots of pieces of coral, big chunks of coral, all in pretty good condition. In the middle layers, we see the corals are somewhat diminished. And there are new players there, bivalves, snails, other types of organisms. And then in the most recent layers, we see almost no coral. We see organisms that are characteristic of rivers and river deltas. The Pearl River's influence is quite strong in these historical records. We can also just go around to local beaches. And next time you go to a beach, I encourage you to dig down into the sand and scoop it up and look for fragments of corals. They're not hard to find. And you might find evidence of one of these very important corals, the staghorn corals. These are one of the best reef building uh, engineers that we have. Unfortunately, their range has been diminished. And you can see from this figure that in the red dots, these are places where we find living staghorn corals. But in the gray area is places where we find only their skeletons and no living colonies. So from this, we estimate their range has contracted by more than 40%. And you can tell very clearly that much of that range collapse is located next to major urban developments. What that means is that our reefs are becoming less complex, and coupled with bioerosion, that is certainly the case. Reefs are becoming less complex, they're becoming flatter. That means there's less real estate. So there's literally a housing crisis for our marine life in Hong Kong. Now it's 2020. There are 7.8 billion of us on the planet. Climate change is one of the biggest threats that we face. We know from the HKO that not only has our temperature increased by 1.3 degrees Celsius, we've also gained a lot of new precipitation that we didn't have before. Our environment is hotter and wetter. There's more runoff into the ocean. There are more stressors that our corals are facing. It's easy to get depressed. It's also hard to forget that we have other local stressors that are equally important. Sewage pollution, aquaculture waste, sedimentation, all of these things we have yet to fully deal with. And now climate change. Coral bleaching for the first time being observed in 2017. But fortunately, our corals are pretty tough. Now, there's not all gloom and doom. There's some cause for hope. And the trawling ban in 2013 saw the end of one of the most destructive fishing practices in our entire Hong Kong waters. That's a remarkable achievement. And we're now seeing recoveries of our local fisheries. Indeed, Hong Kong has an opportunity to be a role model in the South China Sea amongst many different stakeholders. We also have major achievements in government action on cleaning up the water. The Harbor Area Treatment Scheme is one great example of how we centralize all of our wastewater treatment such that the water quality in Victoria Harbor has been improved dramatically. You can even go safely swimming there once again. But the threats are still coming, and we have a major airport development that's underway, big reclamation that will be taking place, and then Lantau tomorrow. This is another big reclamation idea that's going to have very big impacts on our local marine life. So our challenge is, is to take the best science that we have w in the spirit of conservation and balance all of that with our future economic development, and that is a big challenge indeed. Well, we have some solutions. Coral restoration is something that really works. We have introduced corals back into Tolo Harbor where they have been completely removed for centuries. And we find that not only do they survive, but they thrive. And this gives us the idea that if we start accelerating, if we can help these corals spread and reclaim their lost territory, there might yet be hope for building more ecosystem resilience nearby. 2050 is coming. In 2050, there could be 10 billion of us, 10 billion people. And that number scares a lot of people because it means that our resources will become ever more limited. What are the solutions to help us build a better world by 2050? Ecological engineering is one. And I've been fortunate to work with some architects 
to do some really cool design of what we are calling a reef tile. These reef tiles are a way for us to build more complexity on the seafloor. Just like you would tile your bathroom or kitchen floor, we can make the marine environment more complex again. And what's more is that we can plant corals to the surface of these tiles so that we can give them a chance to grow and reproduce and become living coral reefs. Our hope is that our reef tiles won't be needed once that healthy reef is established. And here they are deployed in the Hoi Hawan Marine Park where our collaboration with AFCD is underway. And remarkably, as soon as these things touch the seafloor, they immediately get occupied with new residents. Another idea is assisted migration. So China is the steward of one of the longest continuous coastlines in the world, spanning the tropics to the subtropical regions. The corals that are found in Hainan Island are under severe threat of climate change. The idea of assisted migration is that within our jurisdiction and working with our stakeholders, we might be able to help corals escape impending warming by giving them an accelerated boost to move up the coastline into cooler waters. Another idea, remarkably, is vertical farming. Vertical farming has the opportunity to revolutionize the way we use our land for agriculture by taking it indoors and using the vertical space, something that Hong Kong knows how to do very well. Indeed, I had the opportunity to meet Mr. Arthur Lee, who runs Mo Vertical Farm. And Mr. Lee took decades of experience in the container industry to repurpose shipping containers for aquaculture, which he now does in the new territories with great success. And the last idea, rewilding. Many of you might have heard about wolves being reintroduced into Yellowstone National Park to restore balance to the ecosystem. We can do that too in our marine environment. For example, the tusk fish is an excellent predator of sea urchins. So we could reduce the level of, of bioerosion by enhancing the biological control of those species. And the spiny lobster is also a great devourer of coral-eating snails. So if we could support these two species and allow them to repopulate our local waters, we can reduce some of the stresses on our local environment. And perhaps by reducing the demand for land, we can shrink our footprint we can restore our coastal environments. We can replant mangroves. We can repopulate oyster reefs. We can clean up our waterways. And we can restore that natural landscape, which 3,000 years ago was so critical for our survival. And it really is that way today. Last but not least, we can look at 10 billion people not as a threat, but rather as an opportunity. 10 billion minds will exist who can help us come up with new ideas and new innovation. And I'm very thankful to those minds in this image who have helped me deliver this talk to you today. Thank you very much.